Preservation Perspectives, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's podcast. In this episode, ACHP Vice Chairman Rick Gonzalez welcomes Robert Stanton, a former ACHP expert member and former National Park Service Director. Now he's serving as Vice President of the Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald Schools National Historical Park Campaign. The group is making progress toward creating the first national park honoring a Jewish American. Rosenwald, who was Sears Roebuck leader and a philanthropist, worked with Booker T. Washington of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama to build thousands of schools in the rural South for African American students. He helped the African American community in many other ways as well, helping to build YMCAs, giving out fellowships, and building housing. Now, here's Vice Chairman Gonzalez with Robert Stanton. Uh, Bob, good to have you here uh, this morning. Thank, well, thank you very much. Um, I was looking through the webpage of the Rosenball Park, and what a board and what a group of fantastic people. Uh, Mr. Rosenwald, what a, what a legacy, right, for not only African Americans, but for Americans from the southeastern part of the country. Uh, even here in the state of Florida, on the Florida Historical Commission, we have reviewed and approved several schools. Uh, that he was involved with. So congratulations, what a great effort that your organization is doing. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to uh, serve uh, on the Rosenwald Park campaign and, and to have the support of you, Rick, and your colleagues there at uh, HCHP, of which I uh, enjoy serving as a, as a board member. Yes, and not only just a board member, but an expert, expert board member. I mean, I was looking at your resume and I was going, wow, National Park Service, I mean, all the things that you've done for historic preservation. Uh, thank you very much for your efforts over the years. <laughs> thank you very much. It's been a very rewarding journey. That is for Ex sure. Excellent. Well, I have a couple of uh, questions here for you, Bob. So just feel free to take your time and share with the public, you know, uh, your experience. Uh, I'd like to start with the first one. Uh, first of all, I know who Julius is a little bit, you know, but the public does not. So could you tell us about Julius Rosenwald and also his connection with, uh, with African-American history? Thank you very much. And again, let me applaud you on your leadership and support, uh, Chairman Gonzalez. Mr. Rosenwald was born in Springfield, Illinois, and uh, did not finish high school. He uh, joined with his uncle and some other uh, relatives in uh, New York. Uh, to uh, learn the clothing business, if you will, and being able to determine the quality of uh, various fabrics and what have you. And then he uh, returned to uh, Illinois and uh, ultimately bought, uh, I guess, that uh, one fourth of the shares in uh, Sears and Roebuck. And uh, from there, uh, he eventually <laughs> worked, him way up, worked his way up to become president of uh, Sears and Roebuck and master uh, a, a modest fortune, if you will, in the in the process. Wonderful. Uh, but it's interesting to note that he was born in 1862, one year before President uh, Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation, which uh, he issued on January 1, 1863. So uh, Mr. Uh, Rosenwald had the opportunity to experience a lot of uh, changes in the social order, if you will, from the date of his birth until he became directly involved with the African-American and the African-American experience. And one of his uh, major uh, contributions shortly after becoming the president of uh, Sears and Roebuck was to uh, make substantial donations towards the building of uh, YMCA. And YMCAs, even in Chicago, were segregated. And he made a commitment to any city that wanted to build a YMCA he would put up uh, one third of the money. Wonderful. So that was the beginning of a long-term relationship with, with African-Americans. Wonderful. In reading a little bit about him too, uh, Bob, I noticed that uh, the amount of buildings that he helped, right? This idea, this philosophy of if, uh, if a local city or a local group of citizens would find the land, put some of the money, he would come in and add his money add his skin into the game. And did I hear correctly that he actually helped build over 5,000 schools across the Southeastern United States? That, that is correct. As I mentioned, his, perhaps his first major contribution to uh, uh, improving the lives of African Americans was through his donation to the, uh, to the YMCA. And yes. subsequent to that, 
he had the opportunity to meet the preeminent educator, the late uh, Booker T. Washington, the founder of Tuskegee Institute, which is now Tuskegee University. And uh, they soon developed a very strong relationship. And he became a member of the board of uh, the directors for Tuskegee. And in that relationship, uh, he and President uh, Booker T. Washington reflected on the uh, need to uh, provide educational opportunities for uh, elementary and secondary school children who otherwise would have been denied those opportunities under the staunchly segregation uh, laws in public schools and what have you uh, throughout uh, 15 states as it were at that time. And out of that uh, grew his uh, initial donation uh, on a matching basis or on a challenge basis yes. to uh, communities and to uh, responsible school district to build, I believe, five to six schools within the greater uh, Tuskegee community. And uh, they proved to be extremely, extremely successful. So the idea took, took wing, as it were. Yes. And over a period of uh, 20 years, over 5,000 schools were constructed throughout 15 states, including a little bit over 400 of these schools in my home state of Texas. Wow. Uh, you know, and, and as a preservation architect, Bob, one of the things that I also uh, find very fascinating about this effort was the simplicity, but the quality, the structural, architectural, and historic beauty of these very simple buildings. Uh, most of us, uh, you know, for example, in my community, we have what we call the first little uh, red uh, schoolhouse, right? Yes, when the yes. pioneers came to South Florida, for example. But this was a different effort. You know, this effort uh, was not just a one-room school. I mean, in fact, a lot of the ones that I've uh, I've seen on the His Florida Historical Commission were either uh, two rooms with a central hallway or four rooms. That's correct. And, uh, and they're being they have been restored and. Uh, and so you see the impact of that, you know, um, in the middle of, for example, nowhere, right, that, that someone like him and the community would come together and build buildings to help uh, African American students, you know, to have a, a proper uh, building, right, and here, and because they were built so well, um, a lot of them have survived, some of them have been neglected, but they're being restored, and what a le beautiful legacy, right, today in 2021. That's right, and I uh, heard someone comment, uh early on that uh, he was instrumental in supporting the building of green buildings even before green was popular in terms of <laughs> took, took advantage of the uh, the sun took advantage of the wind how they situated the rooms uh, i mean the buildings on the landscape and what have you uh so uh, it's a great great accomplishment yes yes i mean those central hallways with the tall yeah. windows and the doors getting those breezes and you're you know, you're right you know uh, you and i know that uh, the greenest building is a historic building right because you don't that's demolish it and put it in the landfill you reuse it right so that's uh, correct <laughs> that's correct that's wonderful let me yeah. go on to the next question here that yeah. we have for you uh why a national park uh to honor uh mr rosenwall and the rosenwall schools program why, why do you think that's so important well i think uh, his his legacy uh, and uh, his contributions if you will uh, presents or at least make available lessons for the day. Uh, you know, the concept of a challenge in a matching grant, so, you know, that is sort of the, the way that we do business today, developing right. partnerships. Uh, and also uh, his understanding about the importance of racial relations. Uh, here's a Jewish American, very wealthy, but yet he was willing to give up his resources, his energy, his intellect uh, to, uh, to support the needs of, of others. That's a lesson within itself, and we need to do more of that as a people and as a nation. And uh, but it also, I think he he fully recognized he fully recognized that as a prominent American, uh, he wanted to do as much as he can for us to live up to uh, to our Constitution that spoke with the Fourteenth Amendment about equal protection of the law. And I'm sure he was uh, dismayed, disappointed. Uh, that in 1896, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court handed down an opinion that it was constitutional for us to live but separate but equal. And that, that doctrine engendered all kinds of uh, Jim Crow laws, segregation, and what have you. But I think Mr. Rosewall said to himself, I am going to try to live up to that principle of equal protection of the law, and I'm going to do what I can for a deprived citizen. 
And to that end, he made uh, substantial donations as well uh, to uh, legal firms, and particularly the NAACP, that took to court that doctrine of separate but equal, uh, that were denying young African-American kids equal access to uh, education opportunities. So he was just a giant. He was just a giant. Yes. And, uh, He's an example of lessons to be learned. Exactly right. A, a giant of his time, such a such a thinker. You know, uh, the idea of sharing in the cost. You know, to actually get you know double, triple, bang for your buck on his money. Right. And that's and right. To, that's right. <laughs> I mean, five thousand schools. That is an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, you know? amazing. Some, I believe by me, roughly a tenth of the schools are still in existence today. And they are the pride of the various communities. Some have been uh, converted to museums, uh, yes. uh, to senior citizen home, et cetera, et cetera. Still given <laughs> to the community. Oh, still given to the say community centers, all sorts of good things, uh, yeah. you know, and in a historic setting, you know, and and great way to teach new generations about the value of our historic buildings in our communities, right? That's right. So, that is right. That's always important in our in our uh, mission. It uh, really is. I've got a follow-up question for you. Yes. Um, uh, we really want to know to share with the public. So, in case they want to help, uh, what is the status of the campaign to create this historical park? A little background: uh, Dr. Dorothy Cantor, a distinguished uh, scientist, uh, came up with the idea that maybe we should forge a uh, group of citizens who are concerned and who are interested in recognizing uh, the uh, role and the contribution of Mr. Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald School in our collective history. So we came up with a number of ideas and one was to uh, propose uh, that a uh, historical park uh, be designated to honor his, uh, his legacy and the legacy of the schools that produced outstanding leaders such as Congressman John Lewis, as an example. Yes. Uh, so the idea evolved and uh, we, it gained a lot of support from a wide range of individuals and organizations. To make a long story short, uh, it was my privilege and my pleasure and my honor to uh, testify before the House Subcommittee on National Parks and Public Lands, uh, advocating for the com Congress to enact legislation that would authorize and direct the Secretary of the Interior through the National Park Service to conduct what is called a special resource study to determine what is the appropriate way that the American people could recognize in perpetuity the legacy of Mr. Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools. And we were proposing and still are proposing that there be a national park, Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald School National Park. Congress enacted legislation signed into law by the president and the Park Service now has a responsibility to conduct a study. And we are obviously want to be an active contributor uh, to that study. That is fantastic news. You know, um, you being in the National Park Service and myself on the uh, Florida Historical Commission. Yes. One of the things that I do as the architect on the board is I review uh, sites and buildings that come up for uh, a historic designation. Yes. And usually we just deal at the local and state level. So I love the fact that you're shooting for the national uh, level, which is exactly where this needs to be. This man had a national impact. So uh, the fact that uh, you're pursuing national status for the park with the Park Service and the Secretary of the Interior, well, congratulations and kudos. I think that's going to be the best thing that we could do for him. Oh, you, you're very kind. And it would be the first uh, unit of the national park system that uh, uh, that represents the, uh, the legacy and the contributions to the development of our country of uh, the Jewish American. Yeah. It's a, it's a fantastic story. Yeah, it's a fantastic story. Um, another question I've got here for you, you know, this is, uh, I guess, a design or a vision question. Uh, what is your vision for this park and, and, and the group of people that, that are helping you uh, move this further into reality? Well, I, uh, again, I'm a very strong uh, proponent professionally and personally uh, for the establishment of this park. But as I uh, as shared earlier, there's lessons to be learned in terms of uh, encouraging us to confront the challenges uh, that we, uh, we are experiencing today. And I look at the combination of three forces that really made the schools possible. One is on the part of the young people that they, they had a thirst for education. 
you know, if they did not want to avail themselves to educational opportunities, it would have been all for naught. So they had a thirst for education. And then the power of their parents and their guardians who raised the money or made other kind of donations to meet the challenge of, uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the grant that Mr. Rosenwald was making. It was for the love of their children. It was so powerful. So you had the thirst for education on the part of the children, the love of the children by the parents and guardians, and you had the humanity and the benevolence of a generous, outstanding leader such as Mr. Rosenwald. And yes. you put those three things together, you can almost move uh, earth, you know? And, yes. And it came together beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. And as I travel throughout the country today, there are many citizens, in particular some of my senior citizens, who speak with reverence about having the benefit of an education at a Jewish school and Wall School. And that's very rich. The uh, legislation that authorizes the study uh, direct that we look at several locations, several buildings, if you will, in Chicago or in the environs that may serve as a visitor center that would tell the full story of uh, Mr. Rosenwald and his uh, contributions. And then the Park Service will look at uh, the uh, remaining schools and out of the schools that are currently in existence uh, would recommend how many and in which state that may become a part of the, uh, of the, of the national park. So ultimately it will be a park that would have a visitor center in Chicago or the environs and would have a select number of schools. And then perhaps there will be some type of network uh, to the school that are not officially part of the national park itself. And uh, multi site, a multi site effort, which is it would be a multi site, right? multi site, multi state. Yes, uh, yes, right. And uh, and uh, that that's very rich. Uh, that's very rich. Yes. Yeah. And we'll we the park service will be working very closely with uh, community uh, based organizations and certainly with the uh, State Historic Preservation Officers yes. to, uh, uh, to sort of flush it out, as it were, to, mm -hmm. to come up with some specific recommendations that ultimately the Park Service will prepare a uh, report based on the, uh, the study submitted uh, through channel to the Secretary to the White House and ultimately to Congress. And Congress will make the ultimate decision yes. as to what will be included in such a the, such, such park. And, and what a great impact, because now you're having several sites from a very urban location like Chicago, you know, where he he grew up and he spent time to That's our right. rural Texas, Florida, and other uh, locations, you know, and uh, you spread the, you spread the wealth, right? I mean, and that is correct. And, yeah. and maybe it becomes a all right. Let's go tour. You know how some people tour uh, baseball stadiums, right? Or that's right. That's true. <laughs> maybe we'll we'll start a let's yeah. go tour some of the Rosenwald uh, impact uh, around the country, oh, right? I'm sure that would be the case. That would be yeah. the case. I do want to go back for one second uh, because you touched on something that's very very close to my heart. Two things actually, right? The the love of education in children, right? Yes. And the love of their parents to help them through their education. Yes. And it brings a personal story, very, very important story to me. My mother and my father, when they left Cuba in 1961, they left with nothing. And um, mm. in the 70s, as a young child, I remember one time my mother saying to me, you know, Rick, you can lose everything in life, but your education, that stays in here yes, forever, yes. you know? A communist government cannot take that or, or another. <laughs> you have that. It's, it's like you said, you know, uh, children get, observe it like a sponge. And if their parents reinforce it, right? Uh, what a wonderful story! And uh, and with the generosity of this man to then turn it into reality for them with the buildings and the environments for for the proper education. That's right. And I would hope that as our young people learn more about their predecessors uh, who struggle uh, to attend school, yes, that, that would encourage them to stay in school. <laughs> stay in school. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And one of my other favorite pet peeves is, or, is to have young people involved in historic preservation. Yes, so yes. Hopefully, as you get your park and everything up and running, they'll learn the great stories about Mr. Rosenwald and the schools, but they'll also learn about historic preservation, right? How important that is for uh, our future generations to get the young people involved. That, that's critically important, yeah. Nothing like a hands-on experience. Yes, right. right. Touching and yeah. feeling, right? That's right. 
When you were a council member, you helped create preservation in practice, which includes Tuskegee University students. It's interesting the tie between Tuskegee and Rosenwald. Why is it important, especially now in this age, uh, to preserve the Rosenwald schools and tell the story of Julius Rosenwald's connection to them? As I had mentioned earlier that uh, Mr. Rosenwald and uh, Dr. Booker T. Washington, President Tuskegee developed a uh, strong relationship. And as I have looked at the history, the history of uh, historically black college and universities uh, throughout the uh, country, that some of the president had the same kind of initiative of attracting uh, individuals of the stature of, uh, of a Mr. Rosenwald to be a member of their board and, and make contributions uh, to their respective uh, campuses. So if you were to go to some of the historical black colleges, you will see buildings maybe named in honor of a prominent uh, contributor or donor. Uh, and I think, again, the relationship that was forged between uh, President Booker T. Washington and Mr. Rosenwald set a standard just in yes. terms of how one of prominence can help a small university and out of that great thing can happen, such yes. as the Rosenwald School. So that's a lesson to be learned there as well. But uh, these two men had a, uh, had a noble objective, that is to help others, and they did not accept any kind of racial uh, social uh, economic divide. They were of the same mind. And here you had one who was a uh, Jewish American who rose to great prominence and did not come out of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sadness, if you will, of slavery, such as Booker T. Washington. But yet they were single-minded in terms of helping others. And, and that's, again, is a lesson. But I believe that if you were to also take a look at the preservation of Tuskegee Institute, uh, look at some of the buildings that I believe that uh, Mr. Rosenwald was impressed by the care that was given by the students and many of the buildings, many of the buildings uh, on the campus of Tuskegee University were in fact built by the students. And some of the students were actually utilized, their, their services were utilized throughout the state of Alabama in building some of the initial uh, Rosenwald School. So the bottom line of that story is giving back, giving back, and those who receive have a sense of obligation to build upon the foundation that they were given. Uh, so again, it's a textbook type of relationship between two men who came from different walks of life or different worlds, but yet they wanted to help, they wanted to help others. And that's the lesson I think all of us should embrace, regardless of our background, regardless of our wealth, let us help one another. Well, absolutely. So, and, and again, Bob, thank you so much this morning uh, for sharing uh, your, your, your story here. Um, and uh, we appreciate it at the ACHP. And uh, it's always good to have you involved with us still. <laughs> we okay, can't... yeah. We are my, not... my honor. I appreciate it. Appreciate your leadership and support. Yes, we're okay. not going to get away. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs>